so there was I, a I'm, table before. I'm so going to do, uh, uh, well, that's fine. Um, some of the most exciting accomplishments of Women 2.0, uh, I think are the best example of the best way to make a dent. So how do you make a dent and not, you know, coming from my very instinctive definition of what making a dent means is you can be first, you can be best, or you can change things to the point that people can't even remember how it was before you changed them. And that's how I think of what Women 2.0 did, what Sharos did. I think it's not easy though. Um, we now think that it's so obvious that you have to hire women in tech. It's so obvious that women can and do contribute, not just in the obvious bringing a feminine uh, perspective to the company and to a product, but in many more ways. And I think now it's hard to question that. But 10 years before Women 2.0, it wasn't that obvious. So Shaharos, can you take us through the process of what Women 2.0 became, and especially all of those struggles, because being first is not easy. Absolutely, and first of all, hello, and thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, so reflecting now, right, everything always seems great uh, after looking back when things are, are said and done, but when we started Women 2.0, much like Gail, who mentioned yesterday, it came to me. Uh, I was minding my own business. I had just moved to Silicon Valley, was super excited, working at startups. In fact, working with Ellen at a startup, being a product manager, learning everything on my feet, and then looking up and going, everybody's a dude. <laughs> Which is actually fine, because I like dudes, right? <laughs> but it was very striking to me that every person I was managing, every person who was managing me, every networking event I was going to, I stood out, and I stood out by my gender, I stood out by my race, uh, I stood out for being Canadian, I suppose, <laughs> but it was odd. And I wasn't uncomfortable per se, but I realized the bigger impact of it. And what caused that realization or that aha moment was when I met this fellow named Noah Kagan, who was one of the early employees at Facebook, and he said, you know, you keep coming to my networking events. He was hosting networking events for people who are interested in entrepreneurship you're the only girl in the room, can I introduce you to friends that I, I went to college with who also want to be entrepreneurs? And I said, sure, why, just because they're girls? And he said, yeah, precisely. Yeah. <laughs> and so he threw us into a room uh, one day, booked a meeting room at the early Facebook office, and we met, and we talked, and we realized that the earth was shaking beneath us. It was 2005, and the word Web 2.0 had just begun and people were realizing that tech was about to really reach an important point and it was gonna disrupt every part of our lives. And we just started to feel it, right? It just, just by simple, simple like motions around us. But what we noticed is that when we looked around, dudes were funding each other, dudes were hiring each other, dudes were trusting each other. And so as we sat in that room, myself and my co-founders, we said, we have to do something about this. So we actually did keep our full-time jobs for the first five years. And phase one of Women 2.0 was really about creating connections and creating connections between diverse people. And so the way we knew how to do that was to create open and inclusive networking events, professional events with a casual spin to it, inclusive of men. And usually about 10% men would show up <laughs> and they would walk into their room and go, oh, this is what it's like for you to come to a regular networking event. <laughs> okay, suddenly empathy and understanding was starting to build in those five years. And in the fifth year, something tipped for us. We were getting so much pull from our community to do more, but we still had full-time jobs. And that's when phase two began. And phase two was when we realized the one place we could make change was at the founding level, was that it was about building diverse founding teams of startups, because founding teams dictate the ongoing culture of a growing, fast-growing company. So what did we do? I made friends with someone named Eric, Eric Ries and Steve Blank. Steve Blank was a Stanford professor. Eric Ries was the co-founder and creator of Lean Startup. Uh, and at the time, he wasn't, he was just Eric. Mm -hmm. He wasn't so famous. And I also brought in a woman named uh, Anne Mira Kuo, who's a, who's a very famous uh, investor in Silicon Valley. And we sat down and I said, my hypothesis is I need, we need 
to do something about this. We need to have diversity in tech if we want to solve the most important problems of our time. We need more people at the table innovating together. And my solution I'd like to propose is something called Founder Labs, where we would teach people to go from idea to first prototype within five weeks. And 50% would be female and 50% would be male. And this was the first concept of an incubator as we know it now, correct? Correct, so there were accelerators, there were incubators in a traditional sense, but this idea of a founder boot camp yeah. was brand new. Yeah. In fact, you met Everett yesterday. Everett is a production of Founder Labs. And that, I think he's in the back. <laughs> And that phase two was so important and critical for us to realize that what we were doing was building diverse founding teams that were gonna be the next generation of innovation. And then phase four came out, again, pull from our audience, pull from our community that was growing over time to say we need more stories, we need more role models. And that's when we really said, now it's time for us to be a media company. And people looked at me and they said, you're not a media company, and I said, well, I'm gonna push the boundaries, and I went full-time on the company by then, and that's when I started to balance impact with revenues and build a business that I called, whatever I wanted it to be called, was a community-driven media company, which really nobody knew what to call it other than that. And what that meant for us was creating the stories that were created by the founders themselves on our, on our content, on our network, on our platform, through blogs. It was about putting founders in charge and having them organize local networking events all over the world. And those three phases are you know, ever changing because we were here to change culture. As much as we were a business, our most important thing was to drive impact and to change the culture of technology, to change the culture of startups so that it could be inclusive and it tackle the most important problems of our time with the smartest people who had to look different. Mm -hmm. And phase four is now here. So last year I sold the business and now the company is, is taken on by new leadership that are building a community-driven media company plus a diversity recruiting platform. And so within a 10-year span, we had to be patient with the change and evolve into so many different things that at any point in time, someone would ask me, what is Woman 2.0? And I said many things, and it wasn't a clear answer. And was there resistance to that? I think that um, when you talk to somebody about what their idea, what their product, what their company is, and they don't have a, you know, the elevator pitch, when they don't have that concise explanation and you're dealing with advertisers, you're dealing with investors, you're de dealing with, with consumers, with the public at large, I mean, yeah. producing content for people to, to participate in um, and creating partnerships with media. When you don't have that definition, I am sure it must have been really difficult. I, can you tell me about some of those challenges? Sure. And the benefits of, of kind of being flexible, of being able to, iter to iterate so freely given the successes and the failures you were facing. So we all know Lean Startup, right? So I learned Lean Startup at a very young, uh, young time in our company, at the early time in our company. And I embraced Lean Startup in our business. But it didn't mean I didn't have a one-line description. It just meant that over two years I had one description and over three years I had another description. And Women 2.0 initially was a community for women entrepreneurs and technology. Phase two, or sorry, phase three was Women 2.0 is a community-driven media company. And when it came to the hard things, the hard things came when it was time to make money. Because driving impact, positive impact in the world, again, down to the point of changing the culture of startups and making money is where the friction was the hardest for us. And I experienced that with it. First of all, I experienced that with advertisers. So I thought, I have a media company, I have content, why don't I talk to some advertisers? And they would look at me and go, so what's your audience? These are women that are innovating? I don't have ads for that. How about I give you my remnant inventory? <laughs> Pennies on the door, right? It just, it, it just was such a clash. They didn't understand this new persona and they didn't know how to match that to advertising. So I had to go, I'm not gonna make money on advertising, and took another approach. And that's where we started to build sponsored content, which is now very common, but we, we took that on early on where companies would sponsor specific articles. And the messages of those articles resonated with the values of that company. You know, the other challenge we faced was also with the same media companies wanting to partner with us 
to capture this interesting content we were creating, only to very quickly do it themselves. Mm. And so here we were innovating, trailblazing, and creating content that no one had ever seen. And dare I mention the names of those media companies, but- Oh, I will. Okay, please. <laughs> <laughs> so my, re my research tells me that um, Inc. Uh, magazine developed their own conference, uh, as did Fortune, uh, Forbes. Fortune. Forbes, most powerful women. All of that was modeled after what Women 2.0 was doing. I mean, Women 2.0, now we think of it as a movement. You guys had attracted more than 50,000 people to your conferences. Yep. You know, we think of this as a content platform, but you don't realize that partnerships, um, you know, putting out articles and other publications, but your blog itself reached about a million Every year. Viewers every year. You're, yep. you're truly evangelizing, not just around the, co the, the companies, but potential founders, actual founders. Yep. Those successes are really hard to quantify. I think the big one was, you know, the 30% of, of the companies that went through your programs raised collectively $100 million. Correct. Those are very quantifiable successes, but that's not the limit. Right. At which point do you say, you know, we need to shift our success, our perspective or perception of success to say it's bigger than that. It's right. not just numbers or eyeballs. You know, I think we said that early in the days of building Women 2.0. We said, of course, we need to be a sustainable business. We are entrepreneurs building an entrepreneurial company for entrepreneurs, right? So no doubt there was measuring growth of revenue and margins. But because the impact piece and the mission driven was so important to our business, we did have to have other markers, and so we would survey our audience. So between 2010 and 2014, when we, we, we asked our audience, how many of you are starting a startup? That number doubled, a percentage doubled, right? So people were suddenly shifting, and that was a measure of success for us. And in our later years, when we started working with fast-growing companies who were sponsoring our events so they could attract diverse talent, in between 2014 and onward, so between 2010 and 2014, they worked vigorously with us. Google, Microsoft, all these really thoughtful companies said, we want to be a part of Women 2.0 because we want to attract the best talent. And then it was the end of 2014, and I get a, on the phone call with them. I said, it's time to talk about what we're going to do together this year. And they were like, hey, we've got a head of diversity now. Mm. You should talk to them. <laughs> and I thought, wow. This is the first time you've even said that to me. And for them to spend the time to think about all the things they learned working with us and then implement that through this idea of a head of diversity was just magical. Yeah. Mind you, it also put us in a different, different position because now they were taking the work internally, but they were also taking the work seriously. And so while we didn't necessarily have to have a role in that, that was success. This is a time where I think it's, it's time to address the 800 pound gorilla in the room, right? Yeah. We're talking about, especially me being in news, it's every day, it's constant. A war on women, a ban on Muslims, a war on immigration, the militarization of our borders. Your company's mission was all about embracing diversity. What do minorities have to contribute? Um, why is it important that women arrive at positions of leadership in companies? But that won't be embraced unless it's smart business. <laughs> I'm sure it's as much as you want to do good, it's not just doing good. It was smart for companies to change their model, to hire a head of diversity. What was it that they saw? Why does it work? You know, the numbers have been around for a very long time, right? There's an HBS study that has been updated many times, and more recently it put out the numbers that in diverse teams, you're 50% more likely to get to the correct solution. Okay, uh, a study put out in 2012 by Illuminate Ventures that I always cite that talks about when you add a female to the founding team of a startup, you file one third more innovative patents, you use one third less capital, you achieve 50%, 53% higher return on equity, 63% higher return on sales. <laughs> like, it's staggering that in numbers, it's good business. And uh, another study came out from the National Foundation of American Policy that, said, that tells us that 51% of billion dollar companies are started by immigrants. So it's not just about diversity of women, it is diversity of all types, all ethnicities, all ages, 
and it's the diverse perspectives that, of course, I feel like I'm you know, beating a very big drum that I've been beating for 10 years is better business. But now what's happened is when you don't do that, people are realizing what happens. So two important things. In 2009, Pew Research showed that there was an eclipse in this who is an early adopter. Mm -hmm. And it used to be young white males. 2009, that changed. And it became young, white, black, Hispanic, everything male and women, male, uh, male and female as early adopters. Mm -hmm. So no longer can you build a startup or a product for an early adopter that looks like a young white male. You need to consider diversity at the user level. And if you don't have employees that understand that, you need to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And when you think of all of that change, there's no choice. You think of something like what happened with Uber, right? So the, the world is now very different. Technology touches every part of our lives. And if we don't address diversity now, we have what someone, uh, uh, Susan Wu uh, uh, coined this term, diversity debt. Just like you have financial debt or technical debt, you get into trouble when you don't pay attention to diversity. And when you think of something like even Snapchat, they have not paid attention to diversity and it has affected them. And you've seen the movement of delete Uber and delete Snapchat because users are reacting. They're saying, your practices, your values do not align with me. And that separation breaks loyalty and breaks trust with users. So it's good business internally to build effective teams. And, but ultimately, you're building a business for users, right? You're building a business for customer loyalty. You're building a business, a business that focuses on understanding who you're really serving. And there's that expectation, I think, from this generation. I mean, I think especially millennials um, are known to have that expectation from companies already. Yes. And, and to form groups behind movements that align with their values, which is not perhaps something that you know, we had seen before. And now you, you have these viral campaigns that, that arrive at that. But when building a company, um, I guess the question is, is how do you do it? I've seen, I actually did a story recently about uh, the lack of, of diversity in teacher populations. Mm -hmm. Not enough teachers of color in, in the area where I'm working and why that was important. And one of the reasons, it's not that they don't want to do it. The reasons why hiring um, minority teachers wasn't sticking, it's because the last hired, when there's those efforts towards diversity, are the first fired. Mm -hmm. When things, you know, when, when budgets get tight, then you fire the last hire. And the last hire was kind of a part of an initiative, but not necessarily a priority. So how do you do it? How do you build a company that's truly diverse, that truly connects with, with the user or an audience that values diversity? So last in, last out, right. first out. Last yeah. in, first, first out. out. First in, last out, right? So if that is true, and it is, the first thing, of course, is starting with your founding team, right? ensuring that you're taking the time to ensure your founding team includes diverse perspectives, ages, genders. And that's easy to say, but if you have that opportunity to, to wait a little longer before you bring on that first, second, and third hire, that is what will make a difference. Because the minute your company gets to 10 people and they all look the same, 10 people, just imagine yourself, whoever you are today, Take 10 people that don't look like you, but they all look the same, and you walk into a room, how do you feel, right? So founding teams are the most critical piece to driving diverse and inclusion, diversity and inclusion in innovation. And I'm gonna leave it at that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I know that's not easy, so let me share a few tools uh, that might be helpful if you already have a team and I always hear this, it's so hard to hire diversity and diversely and it's so high, hard to retain that talent. So what can you do in addition to or in lieu of a diverse team? A few of the speakers yesterday talked about design thinking tools. And Lean Startup is another version of design thinking, right? It's all really frameworks that bring you really close to your user. 
And I'm going to propose a few tools that I want you to think about that can be used for your teams to understand your users. But I want you to think about using those tools also within your teams on each other. Because there's nuance even in people that might look the same that you may not pay attention to. So when we talk about some diverse, diverse uh, uh, design thinking tools, one of them is immersion, which is equivalent to customer development. It's really about going to the site of your customer and spending time with them. And when you think about immersion, you really want to pay attention to the nuances. And when you bring immersion or, or customer development into your business, I, I, my suggestion is to, to bring another tool, and that tool is an empathy map. And an empathy map maps out what a person sees, hears, smells, like touches on a day-to-day -day basis in their life and what are their pains and their gains. And if you, you I can post this up on my, my, medium, uh, my medium post later, what really an empathy map is, but if you think of those different elements of a person, you really start to understand the nuances of what this person values, what their pains are, what their gains are, right? And so in lieu of a diverse team, go out to your customers and build an empathy map literally build it with them. Understand, are they in an environment where things are noisy? Do they smell things? How does that interact with your product? How does that change your, how can that change the notifications that come on at what time? Mm -hmm. And what those notifications are? Another thing is to map the values of your users. So understanding values is so critical today. Going back to the example of Snapchat and Uber who aren't paying attention to values. Users are picking companies that align with their values. And if you can deeply understand those values, you can build for that success. So with those three tools, just mm -hmm. simple tools, and I'm happy to elaborate offline, take those tools and have your employees do them on each other as a means of practicing the tools, but finding the nuance of, oh, I didn't know that you valued time over money, mm -hmm. or that you valued, you know, I have value, so I'll give you an example of one value that I think is really important with the Snapchat example, right? <laughs> when, when the filter came out of yellow face and black face, does everyone know about that? Okay, so a very racist <laughs> expression uh, of how to be cute, right? And when I saw that I'm not yellow nor am I black, but my values of inclusion were completely torn apart and I deleted the app. Right, so you don't want to have those things happen. But imagine I could do that with you as my employee and understand what your values are, your nuances are. So there's many ways to think about how, how you can apply diversity and inclusion in your business. Now the last thing I'll tell you is something you can do individually, is that you can invest in diverse teams right now. Investing is no longer closed to the, to the venture world. You have things like AngelList that allow you to come on board if you're an accredited investor to invest in teams that are diverse. And now with things like traditional crowdfunding and equity crowdfunding, you can really decide what the next generation of companies look like, right? You can do that, of course, in your company, like I said, but even with $100, $1,000, and $10, if you decide to put money into diverse teams, the next generation, I promise you, will look different. And you'll be part of an inevitable shift towards greater diversity that, you know, exactly. you want to be part of. Yeah. Thank you so much, Charles. I think we're out of time. Thank you, everybody. Please stick around for a little bit yeah. to answer some questions of those yeah. examples.